بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode we spoke about the marriage of Abdullah and Amina the Prophet's parents and we mentioned that both his parents uh, hailed from noble tribes their parents, uh, their parents were, uh, were prominent, they were virtuous people, they were all monotheists. Abdullah, the father of the Prophet, was the tenth and the most beloved child of Abdul Muttalib, who himself was the chief of Quraysh. Amina, the daughter of Wahab, also was known as the most noble uh, woman among the Quraysh. Her father was the chief of his tribe. So these are tr two very respected noble families who form uh, this, uh, this alliance uh, through marriage. We also shed some light on <clears throat> the, the pregnancy, the conception of the Prophet. We mentioned that there's a consensus among uh, historians, uh, among scholars uh, of both the Shia and Sunni tradition that mentioned that the Prophet was conceived during Ayyam al-Tashriq, uh, which are the, thir uh, the 13th, 14th, or the 15th of the Hijjah. And we spoke about uh, you know, some of the, uh, the discrepancies and the disagreements about the, the date of the Prophet's birth. Uh, the dominant view in the Sunni tradition is that he was born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, whereas the, the uh, the dominant view in the Shia tradition based on the uh, narrations of Ahlul Bayt is that he was born on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal on a Friday. And, you know, a lot of uh, these disagreements uh, go back to the fact that the Prophet was born at a time where, you know, these events were not recorded. You know, people didn't write things down. There was no registry that you could refer back to. So given the absence of written records, uh, and the fact that the ahadith were banned after the death of the Prophet for nearly a century, a lot of this was being, uh, you know, uh, passed on by word of mouth. And then the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, later on were able to set the record straight uh, about the exact date of his birth. Uh, in this episode, I'd like to speak about the Prophet's childhood, uh, specifically uh, the way that he was nursed, and the first uh, few years of his life. Now, after the Prophet's birth, we mentioned that when Amina was pregnant uh, with the Prophet, when she was pregnant, she definitely experienced uh, certain things that we could call miraculous. You know, the, the dreams that she had about, uh, about the child that was growing in her womb, uh, the, uh, the inspiration that she received relating to what she should name him. And we also mentioned that uh, the delivery of the child uh, was also, uh, also had uh, miraculous elements. She reports seeing visions of you know, parts of the world being uh, conquered. And we mentioned uh, some of the uh, miraculous uh, circumstances surrounding the birth of the Prophet. Now, <clears throat> after the birth of the Prophet, uh, his mother, Amina, nursed him, which is, you know, uh, not surprising. So the first one to nurse and uh, nourish the Prophet, sallallahu was his own mother after uh, his birth. Uh, there's a narration mentioned by Alam al-Majlisi in Bihar al-Anwar, where he speaks about the first individual who nursed the Prophet after his own mother. You know, typically when we speak about the Prophet's wet nurse or his foster mother, uh, the first name that comes to mind is Halima. But there were other uh, women who nursed the Prophet before her. So you have Amina, his mother, uh, who nurses him immediately after his birth. And then Alam al Majlisi, he says, Awwalu man arba'a Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi thuwayba. بلبن ابن لها يقال له مسروح 
the first to nurse the messenger of God, of course, after his mother Amina, was a woman by the name of Thuwayba, who was incidentally the slave of Abu Lahab with the milk. So she nurses uh, the Prophet with the milk she was offering to her son Masruh. So this was before uh, Amina was able to secure a permanent uh, foster mother for him, a permanent wet nurse for him. وَكَانَتْ قَدْ أَرْضَعَتْ قَبْلَهُ حَمْزَةَ بْنَ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ This woman, Thuwayba, uh, was the first one to nurse the Prophet ﷺ, according to many scholars. Now, some scholars uh, may uh, question these uh, this uh, report uh, because of the fact that they're not sure about the uh, the religious orientation of Thuwayba. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow his prophet to take milk from a woman who is not a monotheist because we know that the physical nourishment, uh, even in the form of milk, has an effect on the spiritual uh, development of a child. But nonetheless, uh, there are many Shia scholars who do believe that the prophet was nursed by uh, the slave of, uh, of Abu Lahab. And... Alam al-Majlisi says that this woman, Thuwayba, uh, actually nursed Hamza, the son of Abdul Muttalib. So it's interesting that, that, uh, that Hamza is the uncle of the Prophet because he's the son of Abdul Muttalib. He's also uh, the cousin of the Prophet because uh, you know, his, uh, the mother of, uh, of Hamza was Hala, who is the sister of Amina. And Hamza is also the the milk brother, the foster brother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Alam al-Majlisi continues, you see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam later on in his life, you know, when he began his prophetic mission, he continued to show Thuwayba a lot of respect. وَكَانَتْ تَدْخُلُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam فَيُكْرِمَهَا Whenever she, meaning Thuwayba, the slave girl of Abu Lahab, whenever she entered into the presence of the Messenger of God, uh, he would honor her. He gave her uh, special uh, treatment, special respect. وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ يَبْعَثَ إِلَيْهَا بَعْدَ وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ يَبْعَثُ إِلَيْهَا بَعْدَ الْهِجْرَةِ بِكِسْوَةِ the Prophet used to send her gifts. So the Prophet used to regularly send her gifts and he would honor her. So it seems that there was uh, a unique relationship between the Prophet and this woman. And this is what led, uh, this is what uh, kind of uh, strengthens the argument of those who say that she was the, uh, the foster mother, that she was the wet nurse. Of the Prophet, so she ends up uh, she ends up formally accepting Islam uh, later on, and she dies in the seventh year after uh, the Hijrah. We also have a narration in Al Kafi, volume five, uh, page five thirty seven, and the narration is from uh, Imam Al Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, and this corroborates the the report that uh, that was mentioned earlier about uh, Hamza being nursed by, uh, by Thuwayba. The narration says, إِنَّ عَلِيًّا عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ ذَكَرَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ بْنَةَ حَمْزَةَ uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam once mentioned the daughter of Hamza to the Messenger of God uh, in the context of, uh, of marriage. Because if you look at the, the placement of the hadith, you find that it's mentioned uh, in the section on the laws of, uh, of marriage and, and who you're allowed to marry and who you're prohibited to marry. So Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he seems to suggest uh, the daughter of Hamza as a potential spouse to the Prophet. And the Prophet says to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, أَمَا عَلِمْتَ أَنَّهَا بْنَةَ أَخِي مِنَ الرَّضَاعَةَ وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَعَمُّهُ حَمْزَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ قَدْ رَضَعَ مِنْ إِمْرَأَةِ 
The Prophet replies, Do you know, he's speaking to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, do you know that she, the daughter of Hamza, is my niece through milk? Meaning that Hamza, who's my uncle, is also my foster brother because we nursed from the same woman. Now this narration doesn't mention the identity of the woman, but when you bring the the narrations, uh, the reports that mention that Rasulullah and Hamza both nursed from a woman by the name of Thuwaiba, that seems to uh, to bolster the veracity of that uh, of that report. Now, one question that might arise here is that how is it that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, didn't know? Um, you know, because you know we're taught that the Imam Ali salam uh, is uh, you know he he should never demonstrate any uh, moment of ignorance. Now, of course, the way to easily easily resolve this is that yes, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, of course, he doesn't know everything at every moment. He is taught only by God and by His Messenger. Now, if it was some random person who was you know, telling, uh, informing Ali ibn Abi Talib of something that he was ignorant of, then that's then that is that is a theological problem. However, there's no problem. There's nothing that diminishes the status of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib to be ignorant of something and to be taught by the Prophet. You know, Imam Amir al muminin himself says, "Alamani Rasulullah al fabab min al That the Prophet taught me one thousand doors of knowledge. So when we say that when the Imam says the Prophet taught me, it means that. There was a time that he did not know something and through the Prophet he received that knowledge. Or he receives you know, knowledge through a sort of divine uh, inspiration. So that's just kind of uh, a point that I wanted to state parenthetically. Now when we speak about uh, the, uh, the early childhood of the Prophet, uh, specifically uh, his foster mother, the mother, the, the woman who nursed him, you know, the name that naturally comes to mind is Halima, Halima Sa'diya. And uh, so we mentioned that the Prophet was nursed uh, by uh, his mother, by Thuwaiba. There are some other names that are mentioned, but, you know, uh, these are some of the most prominent, uh, the well-known names. Now, the most notable woman who nursed the Prophet for the longest period of time was Halima, Halima Sa'diya. Now, from her name, we know that she belonged to the tribe of Banu Sa'd. And uh, Halima belonged to a clan or to a tribe that used to live in the desert. You see, in addition to the categorization of people based on their tribes, people also divided themselves as city people and desert people. So people who lived in the city of Mecca were known as city people. Whereas those tribes that lived, that lived a nomadic life, that lived out in the desert, they were, uh, they were known as Arab, Bedouins. So Halima was a Bedouin Arab who belonged to the tribe of Banu Sa'd. Now the tribe of Banu Sa'd and other, other tribes had a stellar reputation for nursing and rearing children in the desert. You know, they were known for being experts on child care. Now, <clears throat> there was a custom among all of the noble families among Quraysh in Mecca, the aristocratic, the prominent families. They had this custom where they would send their newborn sons they would send their sons soon after their birth to be nursed and raised in the desert among one of the Bedouin tribes. You know, uh, you know they were able to uh, uh, to do this. Number one, you know, this was a, a sort of a status symbol that that to send your uh, your son to be raised in that uh, in that environment. Now, to us, it may seem very unusual. To us to even imagine giving up your child to be raised for the first few years of their lives in the middle of a desert. Now, in addition to the fact that this was a status symbol, you know, to, to be able to do this, um, 
but the Arabs actually did this for some very practical reasons, and, uh, and we'll go through a few of them. Now, <clears throat> one of the main reasons why uh, Meccans, why Quraysh, used to send their sons. Now, they send their sons, not their daughters, because as, I, as we mentioned in our, in our previous episodes, um, sons were more valuable. You know, this is a, uh, a matriarchal, a patriarchal society. It's a male dominant society. Uh, women were of very little utility. Uh, in fact, as we mentioned, uh, female infanticide was uh, rampant in, uh, in Arabia. And because there was no economic advantage to having daughters, many families would dispose of them, especially because, you know, this was a part of the world where, <clears throat> where there was a lot of conflict and it was a great risk to have women who could be taken as captives and have their, you know, dignity violated. It would bring great shame uh, to these tribes. So they always preferred not to have daughters. So they used to send their sons out to be raised uh, in the desert. Now, the reason why they do this is, number one, it's a lot healthier for a child to grow up in the desert. The reason is because Mecca is a very crowded city. It's a very congested city. And Mecca was known for its uh, its epidemics. You know, uh, in the first uh, few years of the Prophet's life, there was a cholera outbreak. So ap epidemics were not infrequent in Mecca. Uh, the infant mortality rate was uh, was exceptionally high. So families who could afford it, who were who had the resources, they would send their newborns to live in the desert. Uh, as a means of survival, it was safer. Uh, it was a way of protecting uh, the child because, as we know, human beings are carriers of diseases, of, of viruses. So to move a child out of a heavily populated city to a very scarcely populated uh, patch of desert is is much more safe uh, for them to be protected from uh, from disease and illness. So that's number one. So it was a matter of, it was a health concern for them. They wanted their children to be raised in environments that where they would not be prone to sickness and illness. Number two, the Arabs, particularly Quraysh, they used to send their sons to be raised in the deserts with the Bedouins because, let's face it, brothers and sisters, you know, children who grow up in rural towns, you know, because of the the demands of living in rural areas, rural vi villages, there's a lot more manual labor that's demanded of you. So, generally speaking, farmer boys are going to be tougher than city kids, and I think that we can even see this today. You know, it, it takes a lot of physical strength to sustain yourself uh, outside of the city. So it makes you a lot tougher if you could adjust to life in the desert. Now, you know, when you're in the desert, food is not as readily available. You have to be much more, uh, you know, there's a lot more effort that needs to go into setting up a place to stay for the night, your shelter. You have to constantly think about shelter and food and you're, you're constantly exposed to the elements. So it, it builds tougher kids. And this also goes to show you that the the Arabs, the Quraysh, used to think a lot about the future. They, they were long-term planners. They wanted to ensure that their children were able to adjust to life in the desert. So it would make them, it would make it easier for them to deal with hardships. You know, if you're accustomed to a very simple standard of living, then you're not going to suffer a lot because anything is is an improvement from the conditions that you were living in in the desert. So they wanted their children to learn to adapt to hardship. It's a lot easier for children to learn to adapt because they're a lot more malleable at a young age than adults. Number three <clears throat> is that another reason that we can, um, another reason for uh, Arabs sending their children to be raised 
in the deserts with the Bedouins is that life in the desert instilled in them a sense of discipline. You have to be disciplined. You know, you, their chances are you're, you're tending to uh, cattle and flocks. You have to wake up early in the morning. You have to be very uh, attuned to the environment around you. You know, you have to be able to recognize if, if rain is coming, if there are predators. So you have to be very connected to the natural world. It instills in you this, this sense of discipline. Whereas if you're living in the city, you're surrounded by family, by aunts and uncles and grandparents, and chances are you're going to get spoiled. But if you're living with you know, foster parents, you're going to have to learn certain social skills. You have to learn how to make relationships with people. You know, you're not going to be coddled the way that you would be if you were living with your family and your extended family. So you have some very important skills that are developed uh, uh, by virtue of, of being brought up in the desert. Number four is that, and this is probably the most important reason, that is that children could learn the pure, unadulterated Arabic of the, of the Bedouin Arabs. Now, of course, seventh century Arabic is eloquent by any measure. But there is still a difference between the Arabic that is spoken in the city of Mecca and the Arab Arabic that is spoken by the desert-dwelling Arabs. The greatest poets in Arabia belonged typically to Bedouin Arabs. And the reason is because Mecca is a commercial hub. It's a, uh, it's a religious uh, pilgrimage destination. You have people from different parts of the peninsula who are interacting with the Arabs. So naturally, when you interact with people of different dialects and different languages, the language is going to, the quality of the language is going to deteriorate. In fact, even if you turn on the news today, if you, if you listen to Arabic news, you'll find that a lot of the words that are used are borrowed from the, the Persian language. They're borrowed from English. You know, that's why sometimes when, when, when we speak, we say, you're not speaking Arabic, nor are you speaking English. You're speaking Arabizi, right? A combination of Arabic and Inglesi. So, so when you're interacting uh, and when you're mixing with different cultures, the language, the language uh, becomes less refined. Whereas the Bedouin Arabs, because they're not in contact with anyone, they're just mingling and interacting amongst themselves, the Arabic becomes very nuanced and refined and eloquent. So Quraysh... They wanted their children to speak that pure uh, Bedouin uh, dialect, an unadulterated Arabic. And you see that, uh, you know, this was important to many of the, uh, the noble families. So sending your, your children to be raised in the desert would be the equivalent of privileged families sending their children to Ivy League schools. It, it's, a, it's a very similar concept because... You want them to learn certain skills that are going to make them successful in their lives. And one, and the, the most important skill for a child to learn is to master language, to be eloquent, to have mastery over the Arabic uh, language. So you see that this is all prepared uh, for uh, the Prophet Now, so we know that there's this custom of sending newborn sons to be raised by the Bedouin tribes. And this was something that only the nobles and the aristocrats of, of Mecca would, uh, would be able to do. Now, it was common for desert-dwelling wet nurses to period periodically visit Mecca to offer their services to Quraysh. So you see, you know, every few months, there would be a batch of wet nurses who would come to Mecca and they would see, you know, if there are, see what newborns are available from these important families, and they would, they would be hired to raise those, uh, those young boy, those uh, infant boys in the desert. Now, historians mention the arrival of Halima uh, during the year of the elephant, which is the year the Prophet was born, and Martin Ling's, who's uh, who, who wrote a book on the biography of the Prophet in 1983. He has a book called uh, 
Muhammad, uh, his Muhammad, uh, his biography based on uh, on the earliest sources. I believe the title is something like that. So he he basically draws from the likes of Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, and he narrates uh, the following uh, incident uh, in the words of Halima. So Halima, when she arrives in Mecca, and she was a wet nurse, she was looking to to suckle a child. Uh, she basically describes her experience that year uh, in the following narration. She says it, it was a year of drought and we had nothing left. So here Halima is speaking. Halima Saadiya. It was a year of drought. It was a year of famine. We had nothing left. I set out on a gray donkey. So this is an excerpt from Martin Ling's uh, biography of the Prophet. I set out on a gray donkey of mine. And we had with us an old she-camel, which could not yield one drop of milk. We were kept awake all night by our son who was wailing from hunger, for I had not enough in my breasts to feed him. And that donkey of mine was so weak and so emaciated that I often kept the others waiting. The animal that she was riding on, the donkey was so depleted that she had trouble, you know, keeping up the pace with the other, uh, with the caravan of, of other wet nurses. Now, Halima, she's accompanied with her husband, Harith. They arrive in Mecca, and when they arrive, they, pick, they typically ask around, you know, are there any newborns that are introduced to certain members of, uh, of the great families of, uh, of Mecca? Now, Amina, belonging to the uh, the Beni Hashim, Beni Hashim is a, the most noble tribe. She's looking for a wet nurse, and she offers her son. Now, keep in mind, Amina lost her husband. She's a widow. Her young child, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa is an orphan. Now, wet nurses typically did not want to suckle orphans because it was not advantageous to them and, and I'll speak about why they were reluctant to do so so Halima offers her son to one wet nurse she refuses another she refuses until she offers Muhammad the young the infant Muhammad to all of them but they refused and the reason why and, and I'll get to this in more detail a little later on is that the people of the city these families needed the Bedouins to provide a service, but the Bedouins also wanted to establish a relationship with these prominent families. So city people need rural people, and rural people also need city people. So it's kind of a, a mutually beneficial relationship. But the problem is that this child doesn't have a father. Who's going to be our point person? We, if we want... To benefit from this transaction, we need to have someone who uh, you know we need to have a father who we can uh, who we can uh, network with. Now, when presented with the newborn Muhammad, the wet nurses all would say, "An orphan? What is his mother and his grandfather going to do for us?" You know, Abdul Muttalib is an elderly man. Amina is a poor woman. You know. They, so they don't see they don't see that they're going to get anything out of this uh, out of this uh, this family. Now keep in mind their refusal to accept the orphan had little to nothing to do with the fear of not being paid by the family. You know, wet nurses were not really doing this for direct payment. In fact, in the culture of the Arabs, uh, wet nurses typically did not accept direct payment. For their services, for their services, it was considered uh, dishonorable for a woman to charge a fee for uh, suckling a child. So, what was in it for them? Now, they had, they were, they were looking for some long-term advantages. So, as I had alluded to earlier, these Bedouin tribes, they wanted to create a strong link, a strong relationship with. Some powerful families in Mecca, you know, because networking is everything. Relationship is, is everything, you know. Uh, 
you know, your success in life depends heavily on who you know. If you suckle a child for a very prominent family, if you ever need anything, you can call in a favor. You know, it, so it, it makes life a lot easier when you have a relationship with a strong, influential family. Now, a wet nurse particularly had something to gain. So even if she wasn't compensated monetarily, they gained a new son right? who would look at who would look to her as a second mother and feel a sense of duty to her for the rest of his life. So when you suckle a child, that child feels a sense of duty to you. So if you have two children, three children, and you suckle three or four kids, it's as if you have three or four more sons. And the more sons you have, the more protection you have. So a wet nurse would gain, essentially gain a son. The son would see her as a second mother and feel a sense of duty to her. And he would also see himself as a brother to her own children. Right? It's kind of like you know, expanding the tribe, the size of the tribe, without going through the hassle of labor. You just share, you just you know, nurse uh, another child. Now, the, now, but little or nothing could be expected from the foster child himself. So the child is not going to be able to offer you anything. Now, while the child is growing, the father, the father could be relied on. If the the family, the foster family needed something, they could contact the father. They could, you know, if they needed money, for example, they could reach out to him, and uh, the father could normally be relied on to fulfill the duties of the son. Now, in the case of Amina. The father had died, and the grandfather was too remote. You know, they knew that Abdul Muttalib was an elderly man. They knew he pro he's probably not going to live much longer. And Abdul Muttalib has what? He had ten sons, so he has nine sons at least. If Abdul Muttalib, when Abdul Muttalib dies, he's going to have a lot of heirs. So it's not that the grandson is not going to be the direct heir. He's going to have all these uncles. So Amina was poor, and the child's father had been too young to have acquired wealth, and he had no more than five camels, a small flock of sheep, a goat, and uh, a female slave. Now, of course, foster parents were tip were not uh, were not expected to be wealthy, but they were they were also expected not to be too poor because at the end of the day, they have to be able to care for the child. Now Halima and her husband were the most poor of that caravan of wet nurses that came to Mecca that year. And all of the other wet nurses, they found a child, uh, a newborn to suckle. And the only ones who were left were Halima. Halima did not have anyone. And the young Muhammad, the infant Muhammad, had no wet nurse who was interested in suckling him. Now, when all of the wet nurses were hired to suckle Halima to, to suckle Halima, the poorest wet nurse, as we as we've indicated earlier through her own words, the poorest wet nurse and the poorest baby, you know, because there's no father, there's no direct inheritance, for example, they were the only two left. So Halima narrates, so again I'm I'm, I'm quoting from uh, Martin Ling's in his book, when we decided to leave Mecca I told my husband, I hate to return in the company of my friends without having taken a baby to suckle. I shall go to that orphan and take him, meaning the Prophet So the husband says, as you wish. And he said, you know, maybe God will bless us through him. So Halima says, so I went and I took him for no reason except that I could find none but him. You know, it's it was it's difficult to be an orphan in Arabia. You know, no one wants you. And so Halima says that I took him because there was no one else. Then she says, but this became you know the most life changing decision of her life. That orphan became the source of all of the barakah in her life. Little did she know that she was taking an orphan who would become the final messenger of God. She says, I carried him back to, to where our mounts were stationed. And no sooner had I put him in my bosom 
Then my breasts overflowed with milk for him. So immediately she felt the blessings and the barakah of having this blessed child with her. He drank his fill. So remember, Amina was saying that you know she was hungry, there was a, a, a drought, there was a famine. He drank his fill. And with him, his foster brother drank likewise his fill. So the same baby who was crying the night before out of hunger through the barakah of the Prophet, who's also a baby, he's also, to able, able to, he's also able to drink milk from his mother. Then they both slept, the Prophet and the son, the biological son of Halima. And my husband, Halima says, and my husband went to that old she-camel of ours, and lo, her udders were full. The same she-camel who was depleted and who had not a single drop of milk in her, her udders were full. He milked her and drank of her milk, and I drank with him until we could no until we could drink no more, and our hunger was satisfied. She continues. She says, We spent the best of nights, that night, their first night with the Prophet. When he was an infant, she said that was the best night. There was a, you know, presumably there was a sense of sukoon, a sense of tranquility that the Prophet brought with him. You know, it's this is why Allah says, Wama arsanaka illa rahmatan lil that we have not sent you but as a mercy to the world. He was a mercy to the world before he even began his prophetic mission. She says, We spent the best of nights, and in the morning, my husband said to me, By God, Halima, it is a blessed creature that you have taken. That is indeed my hope, I said. Then we set out, and I rode my donkey, the same donkey that could barely keep up on their trip to Mecca, now on their trip back to the uh, the desert, she said, and I rode my donkey and carried him, I carried the young Muhammad with me on her back, she outstripped the whole troop, nor could any of their donkeys keep pace with her. So even the donkey was re-energized, and the entire group, everyone was satiated, everyone had been rejuvenated. She says, Halima says, we reach the tents in the Beni Sa'd country, out in the, in the desert. And I know of no place on God's earth more barren than that then was. But after we brought him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, to live with us, my flock would come home to me replete at every even tide and full of milk. Every evening, the cattle would have so much milk to offer. We milked them and drank when others had no drop of milk. Their neighbors who were also who also had cattle and cows and, and cam they had camels and goats and sheep, none of them were producing milk. And we ceased not to enjoy this increase and this bounty from God until the baby's two years had passed and I weaned him. So for two years they were enjoying the barakah, the bounties and the blessings of having this child with them. Halima says, he was growing well, she continued, and none of the other boys could match him in growth. The Prophet ﷺ was developing very well, and by the time he was two years old, he was a well-made child. And we took him again to his mother, although we were eager that he should stay with us for the blessings that he brought us. You know, so Halima says that, you know, we didn't want to give him up because we, we were afraid that we would lose this source of, of, uh, of blessings and favors if, if he leaves us. So Halima says that I said to Amina, I said to his mother, leave my little son with me until he grows stronger. Because at the time there was a cholera outbreak in Mecca, for I fear lest he be stricken with the plague of Mecca. So Halima agrees to, uh, to send him back with Halima. Now, and of course, during this period, uh, there are even you know, uh, Christian uh, monks and scholars who pass by and they see certain signs in this young boy. And they mention that there are signs that this boy will, 
will uh, will uh, grow up to be a prophet. There are there are reports that mention this, but one of the most important incidents that takes place according to the Sunni narrative is the incident of Shaq al-Sadr, the incident of the opening of the Prophet's heart. Now, according to Sunni sources, there was an incident that took place when the Prophet ﷺ was living with Halima in the desert when he was approximately four years old. And this narration is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, but this is a, a riwayah that is rejected by Shia ulama, and I'll mention why we reject this narration. So I'll read it quickly in Arabic and then I'll read the translation. So this is in Sahih Muslim, reported by Anas ibn Malik, أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله أتاه جبريل وهو يلعب مع الغلمان فأخذه فصرعه فشق عن قلبه فاستخرج القلب فاستخرج منه علقة فقال هذا حظ الشيطان منك Anas ibn Malik he reported that Gabriel, Jibra'il, came to the Messenger of Allah while he was playing with his playmates. He was playing with, you know, Halima's children and some of the neighbors. The angel Gabriel took hold of him. So imagine Jibra'il comes in, presumably in human form, as a man, and essentially tackles the Prophet to the ground tears open his chest, takes his heart out. I mean, talk about, you know, this would be a rated R movie if it was a movie. So Jibra'il comes in human form in front of other children, wrestles the Prophet to the ground, cuts open his chest, takes his heart out, and then extracted a alaqa, a blood clot out of it, cut it, and said, that was the part of shaitan in you. That his window to influence you was through this. And then Jibra'il washed it with the water of Zemzem in a golden basin. So Jibra'il had a golden bowl with Zemzem water. He took out, this is not metaphorical, brothers and sisters. This is supposedly physical. He took out the physical heart of the Prophet, performed heart surgery, took out a blood clot, washed it with Zemzem, and then the narration says, that Jibra'il basically restored it back, put his heart back and stitched him up. Now you can imagine the children ran out of terror to their mother, uh, Halima, فَقَالُوا إِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ قُتِلُ They come running to Halima saying that your son has been killed. Muhammad has been killed. فَاسْتَقْبَلُوهُ وَهُوَ مُنْتَقَعُ اللَّوْمِ She crushes to the Prophet. She sees the Prophet is pale. He's completely terrorized. He's not saying anything, but his, he's pale. قَالَ أَنَسٌ وَقَدْ كُنْتُ أَرَى أَثَرَ ذَلِكَ الْمِخْيَطْ فِي صَدْرِ And Anas... He says that I myself saw the marks of the needle on his breast, meaning that I could see the effect of the, the open heart surgery. Now, what are the problems with this narration? Number one, surgical operations, removing a clot from someone's heart does not make them pure, and righteous. What is the purity, your religiosity, your relationship with Allah have to do with the condition of your physical heart? That's number one. So what's the relationship between the two? So that's one problem. That what is the relationship between physically removing the heart of the Prophet, removing a blood clot? What does it have to do with purifying the Prophet's heart? Number two, this narration contradicts the Qur'an. Because the Qur'anic, we have an ayah in the Qur'an in Surah Al-Hijr, verse 42. Shaytan himself claims, he makes a vow to cause human beings to deviate. 
Allah says, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. Indeed, my servants, no authority will you have over them. You don't have any influence over my, my servants, especially my prophets. Illa min attaba'aka min al so if you say that shaitan had influence over the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed this influence by performing, having Jibra'il remove his heart and wash it, this contradicts the, the Qur'an. Because as we'll come to know, that this, according to Sunni hadith literature, happened multiple times to the Prophet, not just once. So if someone says, oh, this was when he was a child and Allah prepared him, he prepared his heart to be protected from shaitan then why did it have to be performed multiple times? After, at the age of 45, according to their narrations, you know, during the time of Isra and Mi'raj. So that's number number two. It contradicts the Qur'an. إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ كَلَا, لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سلطان. And what does removing a blood clot have to do with blocking the influence of shaitan? Shaitan doesn't exercise power over our physical... Uh, you know, our physical, uh, the, the physical well-being of our physical hearts has nothing to do with shaitan's impact on our relationship with Allah. Number three, let us assume that Allah wants to purify the heart of the Prophet. Is the only way to do that, to send Jibra'il in the form of a man to tackle the Prophet in front of other children, to rip open his chest, to take his heart out, to wash it, to terrorize an entire village, to terrorize a family, because I want to remove a blood clot from the heart of the Prophet. And by the way, this has to be done multiple times. This is how Allah treats His Prophet, that He makes him undergo this type of, this traumatic experience by Jibra'il. So again, it's something that, that defies logic. Number four, one of the primary transmitters of the hadith, if you look at Tariq al-Tabari, Tabari reports this tradition from Thawr ibn Yazid. According to the scholars of Ilm al-Rijal, he was a Qadari, meaning that this is a man who believed in predestination. And if you look at, so this narration supports his theological belief system. This tradition implies that the Prophet's virtue and purity was a factor of this open heart surgery. Not the fact that he, through his free will, he he resisted the influence of shaitan. No, Rasulullah is pure because he was forced to perform an open heart surgery by Jibra'il. This, you diminish any merit from the Prophet by attributing his purity to an open heart surgery done by his archangel that was out of his, out of his control. He didn't even have a choice. Because the, the narration says in Muslim, أَتَاهُ جِبْرِيلُ وَهُوَ يَلْعَبُ مَعَ الْغِلْمَانِ فَأَخَذَهُ فَصَرَعَهُ Jibra'il overpowered the Prophet. He wrestled him to the ground. And he ripped open his chest. So the Prophet is pure because of this open heart surgery that was against his will. This, you completely diminish any merit that the Prophet has. No, Rasulullah is great because he, out of his own free will, did not succumb to the influence of shaitan. And number five, if, the, if this occurred to purify the heart of the Prophet, why did it need to be? It, well, this was repeated, repeated another four times in his life. So Rasulullah is constantly polluting himself, where he, his heart has to constantly be washed over and over and over again. And let's say that, let's say the Prophet did something that was below the divine standard. How about Tawbah? Why does the Prophet have to go through open heart surgery? Why can't he just say, Ilahi, forgive me, you know, protect me through your grace? Why does it have to happen that his chest has to literally be ripped open and his heart has to be taken out? His physical heart. So this is not, if you ask Sunni ulama, what's the meaning of this, uh, this narration? They're not going to say, oh, this is metaphorical. They say, you know, it's physical, but it had spiritual impact. Uh, spiritual impact. Again, Shia ulama, they respectfully reject uh, this narration and, and tag it as a, uh, as a fabrication. So this is kind of a quick summary of
uh, some of the most important events in the first few years of the Prophet's life. Inshallah, in our next session, uh, we'll speak about uh, one of the most difficult moments in the Prophet's life when uh, when he loses uh, his mother Amina, and uh, and we'll see how the Prophet's life uh, evolves after uh, that tragic loss. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, uh, for tuning in. Uh, I look forward to uh, to uh, to speaking more about the life of the Prophet in our next episode. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad hajj al farajan Any questions or comments? Assalamualaikum Shaykh Alaykum as wa rahmatullah so, um, During those two years the Bedouins would take care of the children would the parents uh, visit the children or would they stay apart from them for so for that long? It seems that they would they would visit, you know, depending on the arrangement they have with uh, with the foster family. Now, I would imagine they're not going to be totally. It's not that they're denied any access to the child within that two year period, but I would I would imagine that is very minimal. Um, uh, but there was there was definitely still contact between the uh, the family and uh, and the newborn, but it was very limited contact. They didn't want to to interfere. In uh, in that uh, in that program that they uh, they'd agreed to. And were any of the other imams sent to be raised in the desert this way, especially like Imam Hassan Hussein onwards? Um, I don't I don't think so. I, we we don't have any uh, indication that that happened. Uh, again, when you're raised in the house, when you have parents like you know. Ali and Fatima, you're you're not going to find, you know, a more pure environment, especially if I mean if you're talking about the purity of the Arabic language. You know, Fatima to Zara and Amir al Mu'minin, they're more eloquent than than all of the Bedouin Arabs combined. But this seems to be a, a practice that kind of gradually, uh, that gradually uh, disappeared, especially you know because you know Bedouins were encouraged, you know Bedouins were encouraged. Uh, to uh, to settle, it, it it just became a difficult life to sustain. So you see a lot of the uh, the Bedouin Arabs uh, they uh, they became urbanized, especially with uh, the expansion of uh, of Mecca and Medina. So no, I I don't believe that this this happened with the other Imams. And, uh, could you? Uh, there's a question asking. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Prophet's Rizai family? The prophets, uh, the prophets, what family? Uh, his, his, uh, this family from his, uh, his nursing mother and his siblings. We don't know. You mean Halima Saadia? Uh, yes. So we don't. Again, we don't know very much about, uh, you know, the family dynamics. We we know that she had other children. We know that she was a very, a warm woman, a very loving woman, a very pious woman. Uh, it seems that. Uh, her children had a, a healthy relationship uh, with the Prophet. In fact, uh, historians mention that uh, that the Prophet, you know, showed a lot of love to Shayma, who was uh, his sister, uh, through uh, through uh, Rada. She was uh, his milk sister uh, through Halima. So he 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 kept in touch with uh, with the children of Halima. He respected them. He saw them as his own siblings. So. Uh, we don't. That's really all we know. We know that he had a very healthy upbringing. It was a very a loving family that he was raised with, and it. Uh, you know, these are his formative years. You know, and I think that you know when you look at the prophets, his love for meditation. I think that this is this is related to his upbringing. So, you know, when the prophet, and we'll speak about this later on, the prophets move from the desert back to Mecca. I'm sure it was a culture shock. And he, it seems that he always yearned to kind of be, to reconnect with nature in the way that he, in the way that he lived when he was a child. So you see that he's constantly going to the cave of Hira. He spends weeks in that cave meditating and reflecting. He just he, he craved the silence and the the quietness that he enjoyed being in that open desert. So you see that even as an adult, he's constantly retreating to that cave 
to kind of go back to that state of mind where you're connected with God's creation. So you see how this has an effect on him even as an adult, this, this desire to escape the hustle and the bustle of city life. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, do the Radai kids have a share like in uh, inheritance? Do the Radai kids have a share in the inheritance? You know, I, I, I you know, I, I've taught law, inheritance laws, but for the life of me, I can't think of the ruling on that. Um, I don't believe inheritance applies to them, but I have to double check. It's been a long time since I, I reviewed inheritance laws. All right. Well, uh, th thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much, inshallah. I look forward to our next session.